And hello everyone and welcome back. We are jumping ahead a little bit here uh, in my recording time, not in your time since I will have other episodes up before this most likely. But this is the new series we are starting today. It is Crypt of the Necrodancer, which is now available in Steam Early Access for the price of $15. And spoiler alert, it is well worth it. This is a phenomenal roguelike. A roguelike that can't really fall into the trap of people saying that it's not a real roguelike, because it is grid-based, it is turn-based, but it has a very, very awesome gameplay mechanic that we will get into very shortly. So, let us get underway here, and we will, uh, go ahead and see what's going on here. So we start out in this lobby, and your first thing you're going to think if you haven't seen this game before is... What is up with these lines going toward the center of the screen and this beating heart? Well, what is up with that is that this game's hook is that each beat of the song is actually a turn. You can move on every turn, you can stand still, which you will lose your multiplier, but every time there is a beat of the song, you are able to move. Every time there is a beat of the song, the enemies will move. So, as you can see, if we hit the button at the wrong time, we can't do anything until we hit it at the right time. And it is rather forgiving in terms of timing, but it is still very easy to uh, not quite get right and time a bit wrong and end up in some awkward situations. Um, also, of course, due to the fact that it is a uh, rhythm game, you know, if you lose the rhythm for one beat, it can turn into a mess where you miss it many, many times in a row. So, just a quick overview of the lobby here. Zone 4 is not currently in the game, it is still in development, as will be surmised from it being in early access. Zone 4 still needs added, Zone 1, 2, and 3 here are all in the game. Um, essentially, you have two ways you can play the game. Um, these guys up here that I went to see, who all had items in there, with diamonds listed, these guys are permanent upgrades, which are going to affect when you jump into Zone 1, Zone 2, or Zone 3. There is also Hardcore Mode, which is where you play through the game in... I mean, where you play through all zones in one playthrough. Um, if you die, you start again, and no, none of the permanent upgrades apply. So this is the class... this is the more classic roguelike type play. The three zones here are more like jumping and practice levels. So we're going to jump into zone 1 here to show you what's going on a bit. First thing we're going to see is this X marks the spot rock, which if we blow up with our bomb here is going to open up a teleporter. In this case it gave us a blood shop, which is going to let us trade health for a weapon or other item. I picked up the golden broadsword because I do like the way the broadsword attacks, which is in an arc in front of you hitting the three tiles directly in front of you. Which does allow you to kind of avoid taking some uh, chances. But really, once you are good enough at this game, which I am not yet, the ability to almost entirely avoid damage is there. Every enemy works on a very specific pattern. Everything is completely predictable. There is never a situation when you are going to feel like an enemy did something that you couldn't predict and that costs you a run. Everything moves in a set amount of beats, on in a set pattern, over a set amount of beats. Some things move every beat, some things move every other beat. You know, everything is very much discernible, and as you play more, you get to understand what is going on with their movement patterns. And that, of course, makes it so that you can attack safely and without risking your health. Now, the golden broadsword that we have here is, as you might expect, going to give us more gold drops um, when, we hit, when we kill enemies with it. I am doing very bad at keeping the beat that comes from uh, not being experienced talking while playing this game, which is probably one of the hardest games to commentate that you will find out there at the moment. And it is going to take me a while to adjust to that uh, needing to pace things. I'm needing to try to keep the beat while I'm talking. It's going to take me a while to adjust, and in the meantime we're probably going to do rather poorly. So we can come up here to our shop where we find a torch, and you know what, for 30 gold, this is the Ring of Gold, it is going to give us more gold drops as well. Which means that getting money should not be an issue on this run. Um, you know, don't get me wrong, this isn't going to be like a high score type run. But it is certainly going to be something interesting. 
I mean, we're certainly gonna have enough gold to afford whatever items we come across, is I guess what I should say. So, we are going to do our best to keep on the bead here. There are uh, hidden chests and hidden rooms in the walls which you can dig through. Your basic shovel that you start with can dig through the dirt walls. You can get shovels that can dig through walls such as these rocky ones. And if you notice those lines have turned red, that's because the song has less than 45 beats left. And if the song ends before you go down the exit stairs here, well, watch what happens. Since I don't have a multiplier to lose, it doesn't really matter. But when this uh, song comes to an end, a trapdoor will open below us and we're moved on to the next level. So there is kind of that soft timer mechanic in it, which is going to allow you to, um, which forces you to keep moving. You don't really have the option to just stand back and take things super slowly, because as soon as the song ends, your time in the game, and uh, your time in the run is over. Well, not in the run, but in the uh, level, I should say. So that was a Minotaur mini boss, very easy to take care of with the broadsword. We've got these skeletons who are kind of not that annoying, but oh god. I almost thought there wasn't a way out of here for a second. Those bounce traps will of course bounce you forward one space on the same turn that you hit them. We do have a little bit of a diamond hidden in the wall there, which we can pick up. We're not going to get enough to unlock anything most likely, but... Um... I'll stick with the broadsword. The broadsword and the, uh... Longsword are both good in their own ways. The longsword gives you a bit more range, whereas the broadsword lets you attack from an angle. Um, it's kind of six to one, half a dozen to the other in terms of which I prefer. But in this case, we'll just stick with the broadsword since it has a modifier and the longsword was just plain. There are other weapon modifiers as well, by the way, which we will probably run into at some point, if not on this run, on one of the runs that we will be doing here. Um, you know, I usually try not to play all that much of early access games because I don't want to risk spoiling the experience for myself. But Necrodancer is just so well realized already that I find it hard to not just jump into and play. I mean, this is a game that is pretty much, you know, the content isn't all there yet, but the mechanics are spot on already. So in here we have a titanium shovel we could buy that would let us dig some more. We have cheese, which helps us heal, which we might as well pick up so we could use the health. And then, you know, we'll go with the Blood Longsword. I think we don't need the gold as much anymore. And the Blood Longsword is going to let us heal after we kill certain amounts, certain numbers of enemies. So that's quite useful in its own right. And we're just going to hop down this way. The exit is marked on the map there in the bottom right corner by way of the little purple dot you'll see in the room over here. And let's see what we got going on here. Of course, the longsword's range gives it some advantages. We do get some chain mail, which is going to help us to take a bit more damage. That is, I forget what that shrine is, but it's one that can be a little bit dangerous to take, I know that much. So now that I'm getting the, uh, controlling the beat down while, uh, dealing with the commentary here, this is getting a little bit better. Oh god. That was my mistake. That was fully my mistake in terms of how I handled that. That trap over there with the double arrows to the right would speed up the tempo of the music, hence making the beats come more often, hence making you have to adjust how quickly you're moving. Ring of Courage, you know what, I'll take that over the Ring of Gold. Again, we don't really need the gold right now. Magic Torch, we get a drumstick, we get a holster. The War Drum, I apologize, I haven't really shown off much. Um, essentially what it does is it lets you stand still while keeping your combo, because you are able to play the drum into, instead of moving. Um, and as you play it more, as you hit more beats with it, you actually get damage bonuses for doing so. So that is the advantage of that, it's not something that really came into play on this run here, but... 
Almost got messed up there by way of that uh, bounce trap. So the Ring of Courage, what does that do? That means that when we kill an enemy, we're also going to move forward in the same turn. Which gives us a little bit of openness to uh, move forward and to move quicker. But also, when we move forward on that turn, we are invincible. So we are able to kill an enemy, move forward, and if we would take a hit by doing so, we don't take that hit. Which is, of course, hugely useful. Let's head down to our first boss fight here, which is going to be Conga Line. Which means that every 8th beat we need to skip. Ring of Courage is actually throwing me off quite a bit here. Now we have to fight King Konga, who was easy enough to kill, although I did not do that cleanly. And that's zone 1 complete. I think that gives you a pretty good idea of how the game works in general. Um, now, Hardcore Mode is where you play through everything at once. That's much more difficult. Um, we won't be getting into that very early here, but let's jump into Zone 2 here where things start getting a lot more difficult, mind you. Oops. Took a stupid hit already. This is also a level that I am less familiar with. Um... Oh god. Dragon, why? I mean, once you get these guys into a pattern, they're not that bad to deal with. But don't get it wrong, that means that they're easy. Oh. You know, especially when there's other stuff going on. There it wasn't so bad because we had... Glass Whip. So glass weapons are the most powerful in the game. The catch of them is that if you take any damage while wielding one, they break and turn into a glass shard that does the same amount of damage as your starting dagger. Now all we had was a starting dagger, so there was really no risk to us taking that. As you can see, the whip attacks at pretty crazy angles, which allows you to get some hits without putting yourself at risk. Oh god. Oh god. Okay, that was a death. That was definitely a death. Quick restart. That moment when you take the hit after getting a glass weapon is horribly, horribly scary in terms of how to handle it. Let's go this way. I should also add, if you uh, are interested in the music, I believe the soundtrack version will be ten dollars extra with the additional time with the game. So you'd be looking at twenty-five with the soundtrack. It is made by uh, Danny Barankowski, um, who, of course, you might know from Super Meat Boy, The Binding of Isaac, countless other indie games. Um, he is the one doing the music for this game, and it is all so so wonderful. Well, that was not a bad position to end up in. The bats you have to kind of be careful of, because they're going to move in a random pattern. Um, they are the only enemy that is going to not move in a set pattern. Um, we're going to buy these two. The gold dagger, of course, can give me more gold drops, much like the gold broadsword did. And the uh, Crown of Thorns is going to act as kind of, if I understand right, um, the same way as a blood weapon would. So combining between those I think is a pretty good pickup. And we're just going to kind of explore and make sure that we saw all of the floor that there was to see. We do of course have to worry about the song ending. But yeah, all the music is made by uh, Danny B. And it is all phenomenal. I highly recommend you pick up the uh, version with the soundtrack. It is one of the best game soundtracks I have heard in recent times. And there have been some really good ones, not the least of which being something like, you know, Shovel Knight was really good. Um, I love Bulgar soundtrack, Our Darker Purposes soundtrack. Um, there have been a lot of really good game soundtracks, and I think this is by far the best. Um, and I think that's because the game was designed around music being a key component, and so the soundtrack was made in a way that made it happen. Now, I don't know if we're going to get back to the exit in time. We are running a bit short on beats, but we already killed the boss, and we um, 
have no multiplier to lose, so it's not a big deal if we don't. We're gonna kill one of those mushrooms, get our multiplier back. Giant enemy means he's gonna give me a scroll. Oh god. I forgot about how that was gonna work. I did not know that I would turn that to ice permanently. Oh, huh. I learned something new right now. Ice does play a factor in the third zone, mind you. Um, in this zone, it's kind of that's the only situation where you're going to see it, apparently, but... Oh god, what am I doing? As you can see, despite the fact that I prepared a bit, I'm still not very great at the game. I kind of purposely put myself in a position where, at least for the first couple of videos, I could do, uh... There we go. That took longer than I would have liked to pull off. There's a diamond in the wall up there. Ring of Gold I'd like to pick up. The Obsidian Dagger is good once you're better at the game. Um, for someone like myself who is not so great at it just yet, Obsidian is kind of a... Um, it's still an upgrade. It's just not as noticeable an upgrade as some of the other ones. Um, essentially what Obsidian does is its damage is based on your multiplying. That worked out very well. Um, I just kind of did things without really paying attention. But yeah, Obsidian works based on your multiplier. So if you have a 3 times multiplier, it is going to do uh, 3 damage. If you have a 2 times multiplier, it'll do 2 damage, etc, etc. And so, you know, it's a good item, but the better you are at keeping your combo, keeping the beat, not getting hit, um, the better Obsidian is going to be for you. Whereas me, who especially while talking while playing this, is not doing so well with that stuff. Um, that was really stupid, so is that, so is that. Um, I, I forget what I was going to say. Um, but yeah, Obsidian can be useful. Um, it's just not quite as good for a less experienced player as, you know, um, Titanium is one that gives you an automatic 2 damage on every hit, um, which is hugely useful, of course, because it's twice as much as what the basic dagger- Oh god. Oh god. Why Ring of Phasing? Give me Ring of Gold. Ring of Gold, please. Thank you. Ring of Phasing is an interesting thing, because it's an item that should be really awesome um, in theory, but in practice turns out getting you killed more often than it helps you. Essentially what Ring of Phasing allows you to do is to go through walls, which means that you don't have to worry about the layout of the level anymore, you just worry about... You just worry about, um, Jewel Dagger. I don't know what Jewel Dagger actually does. Jewels consumed, I know that much. Now it looks like just a regular dagger. Didn't do any extra damage with that hit either. So when you find the X marks the b spot blocks on the um on the um Sorry, had to concentrate there for a moment. When you find the X marks the spot spot blocks on the uh diggable tiles there, you can get a challenge room, which is going to be a little bit more difficult, and you get one of three rewards. We're going to go with black chest, which is uh, inclined toward weapons, um, as well as toward um, which is inclined toward weapons and armor. Um, the purple chest is inclined toward things like rings, the regular chest is inclined toward torches, toward um, What's the other one that's big in that? Um, rings are big in the purple chest. We're going to pick up the monocle, which is going to let us see what's inside chests, as well as... 
That's how the war drum works, by the way. The whip can be a terrifying weapon to use, because you can expect to move sometimes and then end up not being able to move due to the whip's movement. That time, I just misestimated where it was going to attack. Let's return to lobby real quick. We're going to go character select, and currently there are, I believe, four characters in the game. Cadence, who we're playing as now. Um, Arya is unlockable, as is Bolt, who are unlockable by uh, getting into, I'm mean, by beating hardcore mode. Bolt makes the music move faster, Arya makes it where if you miss a beat or take a single hit, you die, and you can only use the dagger. Bard is very, very unique of the uh, characters as well. One second while I take a drink, please. The Bard's main uh, quirk, <laughs> so to speak, is that he takes away the movement requirement that you have to move on the beat. So as you can see, he can move really, really quickly. Uh, stay to spend diamonds. How many diamonds do I have? Oh god, I can't get off of here. Um. Okay, there we go. So I think I can buy, uh, yeah, this meat here. So yeah, let's uh, jump into Zone 2 with the Bard, where we have full control over the beat, and by extension we have control over enemy turns. Every time we move, the enemies get a turn. Every time we don't move, they don't. I accidentally hit the wrong button there and it cost me. I do still tend to kind of stay toward the beat of the music right now because I'm trying to practice. But if you look, I can also, you know, go really fast and probably hurt myself even more than I already have. Bard has some unique quirks in terms of adding difficulty, too. Um, because when you think about it, some of the time that you're playing, you kind of expect to be able to use the ability to stand still to make enemies move. Glass broadsword, sure, why not? Glass is, again, the strongest type of weapon in the game. But yeah, um, you know, sometimes when you're playing through, especially when you haven't been playing through on, like, Aria mode or something, where missing a beat kills you, you know, you expect that if you stand still, the enemies are going to move. Oh god, what have I done? So, by going into, um, bard mode, you kind of have to always make a move to make the enemies move, which can be rather tricky. Also, I should add, you may notice that all the things on the left I'm picking up have, um, have just two directions associated with them. But, um, yeah, they just have two directions associated with them. Why is that? Well, because, um, sorry, I got distracted there. Why do they have that as the case? Because they are... What am I looking for here? Oh yeah, that's what I was going to add. Because uh, the game is actually entirely based on the arrow keys. There is not a single control in this game which is anything except for the arrow keys that is necessary. You can actually bind controls. Um, if I were to go to... The options here and go to uh, reassign controls. If you look, I can set combo left, right, up, down, up, left, up, right, down, left, down, right. All of that I can set to keys, which means I can have um, keys for every option available. But at the same time, the only required keys to play the game are the four arrow keys, and that's all. Which is really, really. Uh, awesome, in part because it allows you to actually play this game in 
uh, this game has full support for dance pads. So if you have a dance pad that you would like to use to uh, play Necro Dancer on and actually dance along with the game, that's actually a thing the game was designed with in mind. So you can absolutely do that, no problem at all. Uh, I don't actually know what this item is. Ring of Protection. Don't know what you do. The Ring of Peace isn't bad at all. Makes it so less enemies spawn on each floor and the uh, easier version of the mini bosses spawns for you. But I'm not really interested in that right now while playing Bard because, you know, part of the catch here is that you have time to think, which is not a luxury you are usually afforded while playing this game. Uh, time to think is kind of a huge luxury to have. Now these skeletons work by way of, um, if you do enough damage where you would kill the skeleton in one hit, then they will drop their shield when they're hit. If you don't do enough damage to kill them in one hit, then they will block your attack and you'll have to wait and try to kill them after you have I'm from the side to get them down to where they lose their head, at which point they will drop their shield. So it does cause you to kind of make a conscious effort to um, make a conscious effort to... Yeah, I was afraid that was going to happen. I didn't really have a good angle to go at that guy from, so I was kind of trapped there. Red bats are some of the hardest enemies to deal with in the game. Um, by virtue of, they move every single turn, which not many enemies do. And on top of that, they are actually, um, they are, much like the other bats, the direction they move in is random. So there is no way to know where it is going to move to try to stop it. Ha! That's what you get, clone. Magic Torch is the top tier of Torch at the moment at least. And as you see, you know, playing in uh, bard mode here does certainly have its things that are easier. What do you do? Ring of mana? I don't know what that's even for. We're gonna get plate armor. Might as well get the titanium spear on top of the uh, obsidian spear. And I think we're ready to go on to the boss fight. So there are a variety of bosses in this. Um, Okay, so the Shrine of Risk is making me lose my multiplier at the start of each uh, level. Got it. And you might say, well, you fought the Conga Lion last time on Zone 1. Well, that's very true. Um, get a glass shovel that can appear in chests, a bomb spell. I could also go here. As you see, at least currently, there are three bosses in the game. Deep Blues, Death Metal, and King Konga. Now, each of these has three different types, depending on which zone you get it in. If you get King Konga in Zone 1, it's a bit different than Zone 2, and same with Zone 3. And same thing for Deep Blues and Death Metal. Um, sure. Let's uh, let's go into that guy on level one real quick. Bathe in fire! Bathe in fire! Bathe in fire! So yeah, the bosses themselves, um... You know, I have a decent idea of their patterns. Not necessarily fully understanding them, but I have watched, um... If you didn't know about it beforehand, um... There was an event called the Necrothon the developers were putting on, um, during which people were making an effort to, um, they were making an effort to, uh, kind of get some streamers playing the game in uh, anticipation for the release, 
they threw in a bunch of their own money as prizes, um, both toward the streamers themselves and to charities. Um, I've been watching quite a bit of Bananasaurus Rex playing during the Necrothon, um, and so I do understand things a little bit um, more than I normally would, but not necessarily a whole lot. We also have this area where you can uh, go to practice fighting against various enemies. Now if you notice, one of the things that you can pay attention to with these characters is um, Okay, it's not doing it now. But, now that we're back in combo mode, you see we're both on dark squares. So every move that we make is going to take us to a dark square, which means that I can never line up because we're always going to want to move to the same square if we, and we're always going to cross each other's paths if we move. Now, if I were to, say, drag her over here, and, oop, that's not what I want to do, and jump over here, now I'm on a dark square, she's on a light square. Okay, that still works, even though I kind of messed it up a little bit. And so, now we can easily move and be in contact with each other. So we go like that, we go like this, and now we can kind of dance. That is one thing that you have to be a little bit good at picking up on um, when you're trying to play this game, is the color of the square you are standing on and the color of the square your enemies are standing on. Because there are plenty of enemies that are... Uh, there are plenty of enemies that, uh... That kind of, um... You benefit from being able to... See what square they're standing on. Around and around and around we go. Wah! I don't know how this is working. I'm just kind of hitting keys randomly. Okay, well anyway, this is going to wrap up our uh, first episode of Necrodancer here. Um, with that little bit of silliness. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you are interested, as mentioned, this game is available on Steam Early Access starting today. Highly recommend it. It is an amazingly well done game. Um, you're going to be seeing a lot more of this from me. Um, including after we get some practice and we get competent on Zone 2 while talking. Um, and we get into Zone 3 while talking. Um, I will be jumping into Hardcore mode as well, moving on to trying to beat the whole thing in one sitting with no upgrades. So there's a lot to accomplish in this currently. Thank you guys for tuning in, hope you enjoyed, and I will see you next time. Take care, excuse me, take care everyone, and have a good one. Later.